Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John McDermott. I'm the head of the Department of Computer Science here at the University, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, first lecture in our new public le lecture uh, series. Um, what we wanted to do was to engage people from the local community and, and bring them um, into this new campus. So hopefully those of you who've come here for the first time, you can see something of these marvelous new facilities that have been built for us. I have to do a couple of bits of, of housekeeping. First of all, if you have one of these, please turn it off if you haven't already. That includes you, John. Um, also, we're not planning on a, a fire alarm or a fire emergency. If there is one, take the easiest way out through that door and out to the so-called academic square, the open area in the middle. But it's easy, just follow me, because I'll be out first. <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm delighted for the first of these lectures to introduce my colleague um, John Clark to speak to you this evening. His original background was a mathematician. Um, he worked in industry for a number of years, running a security evaluation um, center for government. Um, one of my best moves was uh, bringing him here or persuading him to come here in 1992. And for nearly 20 years since, has been working on many and varied things, including carried on um, work and interest in um, security, which you'll hear something about um, this evening. So this evening you'll hear erudition, entertainment, and also some enigma. John, over to you. Uh, thank you for inviting me this evening to give the first in this series. I think it's wonderful facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Facilities are wonderful. I could lecture all night, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, the title of this talk is From Enigma to Your Cash Point Card and Several Centuries Back, and you'll see why very shortly. Oh, yes. You're not exactly a rock concert crowd, I can tell, but the, <laughs> the meaning will become clear fairly shortly. What am I going to do? So, cryptography. Oh, What's the story? Cryptology, what's the story? I want to provide a rapid introduction to cryptology, and I can assure you it is going to be a roller coaster ride. I want to examine some major events in cryptology and ask questions like what lessons did we learn and what lessons didn't we learn? Because there's been plenty of both throughout history. Now, let's pay tribute actually to some of the phenomenal achievements, both intellectual, engineering, and, and practical, over the many years. So cryptography, just who needs it? Well, anybody who wants communications to be hidden from others. So here's a few. I thought I'd do my best to place it in a historical context. Uh, the Spartans invented the uh, sky tail, which is this thing you can see there, which is essentially a strip wrapped around a rod, etc. And you can actually see when you wrap it around the right rod with the right diameter, the message appears. So that was about 500 BC or there and thereabouts. Julius Caesar, you'll know him. He was uh, at the forefront of a rather aggressive form of package tourism, which we were <laughs> subject to. He also was interested in communicating securely, particularly in battles, for example, and we'll see his cipher later. Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, certainly liked cryptography. Unfortunately, uh, the cryptography she was engaged with was bad cryptography, and she paid for it with her life with the Babington plot. And here's one who probably doesn't actually sit here Bellerophon, who rode Pegasus, the winged horse, who was sent with a secret message telling a king to kill him. Uh, he was somewhat resilient. Uh, anything he was asked to do, he survived. And arguably, he didn't personally feel the benefit of cryptography, given that the message said, kill this person. What about today? Well, who wants cryptography? Who needs it? Anybody who wants communications to be protected from others. It's exactly the same reason as I gave earlier on. Any military force... Uh, that needs to communicate, and by and large, that's all of them, and they need to communicate together, as represented by this uh, starred diagram. And basically, you need it. You need it, you want it, and you're going to get it whether you like it or not, one way or another. Why do you need it? Here are some reasons. You're, who has online communications with their bank? Who banks over the web? Right, you need cryptography. You may need the bank's cryptography like you need a hole in the head, but you need cryptography. Okay. Communication with the smart home. You might not think you've got a, a smart home at the moment, but you're going to have one. Smart metering is on the way. Imagine what's going to happen when the metering systems that you actually have can have software downloaded over the 
over the net, reprogramming your meter, uh, re, uh, changing the charges, the tariffs on a minute by minute basis possibly, etc. cetera. How would you like the idea of somebody fiddling around with that and altering them? I suppose if they, if they altered them one way, you wouldn't mind at all, but if they altered them the other way, you would care deeply. You need cryptography because cryptography is one of the mechanisms which lies at the heart of actually protecting these sorts of communications. And smart metering is on its way. Right, here's a, a very rapid introduction to classical encryption, or subtitled, What the Romans Did, or What One Roman Did for Us and yeah. Others, of course. I'm going to talk about classical substitution ciphers, because I'm going to talk about cryptography and I'm going to talk about substitution. It makes sense to go back to basics. So character, sim classical simple substitution ciphers are essentially character for character substitutions. So up here you can actually see I've got hello roundhouse. Okay, and I want to encrypt, this is, this is worth protecting, this is secret information. I don't want anybody to know I'm actually saying this in, the, in public. Sort of thing. So I'm going to encrypt this. And you will see two rows here of letters. One is a letter of all the letters of the alphabet in a row. That's the plain text characters. And beneath it, you will see a jumbled mess. In that second line of characters, each and every letter of the alphabet appears once and once only. The two lines actually, deter, actually define a cryptographic mapping. So for any letter you see in the top row there, directly underneath it is a corresponding character, which is its encryption. So for example, left to right, if you see a letter A anywhere, sadly there isn't one in the message, you would encrypt it as J. Let's see what happens when we encrypt hello roundhouse. There we go, we can actually see here. Let's have a look. H-E-L-L-O maps to D-A-N-N-S. And if there's any justice in IT, D-A-N-N-S is what actually appears. Round, R-O-U-N-D. We substitute letter for letter, which will give us U, S, L, where's N gone? T, B. U, S, L, T, B. And I think you'll trust me that house, which is now the blue ones, encrypts as that. And so hence my encrypted call at the beginning of this session, which was dance U, S, L, L, T, B. No response, it was hello roundhouse. It's the only chance I'll be to act like a rock star. So, <laughs> though it has to be said, I think I'm the first person ever to do this with encryption, I should point out, right? <laughs> Reversing the process is straightforward. If I have D here, I look up D along here. Ah, I can see it there. That corresponds to H. I get back the H of hello. Character by character, I just reverse it. It simply reverses that operation. Rather than come down, you go up. Gaius Julius Caesar, as I said, this is the, I came, I, was it, I came, I saw, I did little shopping, was the, not the nine o'clock news version of it. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the Latin for the, latter, the last bit is. If we encrypt hello roundhouse here, well, here's a, a very simple form of substitution cipher. You'll notice that the second row here, the encrypted characters, actually look very similar to the ones above, but they're just shifted by three characters here. So A goes to D, B is replaced with E, C is replaced with F. So let's do hello. Well, we can say that goes, H goes to K, E goes to H, L goes to O, L goes to O, O goes to R. Hello. So K-H-O-O-R. Exactly the same as before. You just repeat the process. Character for character substitution, R-O-U-N-D goes to U-R-X-Q-G, and house, H-O-U-S-E, goes to K-R-X-V-H, and you decrypt as before. Who needs anything else? Well, as you might have gathered, things have moved on a little bit since 55 BC onwards. There's a problem with that sort of character for character substitution, and it's this. If you know or can guess a message part, you're well on your way to discovering the key. So if you know, and here are some examples below, uh, you might not know that these are in the message, but if it's a letter, for example, that's being encrypted, you could have a good guess. Uh, quite a lot of letters, for example, start dear sir or madam, or to whom it may concern, and in my case, a lot of letters start dear John. 
Uh, it's an occupational hazard of being me. Um, and and so, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of Dear John letters over the years. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly expecting one anytime soon, <laughs> but if I do get one from my wife, and it was encrypted using a much simple substitution cipher, I'd feel doubly aggrieved. Not only would my love have been spurned, it would have been wrapped up in something I know to be cryptographically insecure practices. <laughs> <laughs> Further to this, don't start your messages with, uh, the, quick brown the, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Why? It's got every letter in the alphabet. Arguably, it's not the best thing you should start your letters with. It's not particularly stylistic. It's not well received by the pedants and um, the, uh, the linguistic fascists around the place. But now you know it's actually cryptographically not justified either. What happens with these sorts of ciphers? And th this is the problem. That's one problem. There's another problem. Even if you can't actually guess some of the text, which uh, is part of it and typically in the intro, you can do frequency analysis on this sort of thing. If X happens to be in your jumbled characters, your ciphertext characters, happens to be the most commonly occurring character, then it's the, it's the encryption of something, and it's the encryption of the most commonly occurring plain text character. And in English language, that character is the letter E which is uh, indicated here. This is a frequency graph, uh, about 12% or whatever, 11, 12, 13%, depending on what you look at. That's the frequency of occurrences of, no, the fraction of occurrences of the letter E in standard English. And you can use that sort of information. You can guess the vowels. Most of them are actually pretty common. There are also common bigrams. TH together is very common. THE is the most common trigram in English in English uh, sort of literature or any sort of uh, text. Why? Because there's then, the, we use that a lot, then, they, them, therefore, that occurs all over the place. You can use those sorts of frequency characteristics to reverse engineer the actual mappings from the ciphertext characters to the plain text characters. And once you've got about half of them, when you actually, it just looks like badly spelt English text. And then you can fiddle around and you just, the rest just drop out. You need to get a toehold. So that's a problem. Well, here's one solution, and it's from the 15th century. This sounds quite sophisticated. They were quite sophisticated in the 15th century. It is possible that this sort of thing was known about 600 years earlier. It's called a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. And essentially, well, if the problem was the fact that these, the, the characters in naturally occurring English text actually have these strange or characteristic frequencies which allow you to exploit them, them to be exploited, Let's try and flatten the frequencies of those. Let's try to get rid of that sort of information. Well, we could decide to use several uh, encryption algorithms at the same time, or in fact, se sequentially. So what we've got here is a, something called a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. And I'm, so you can see A, B, C, D up, up to Z across the top. That's what I'm going to encrypt letter by letter when I want to encrypt my message. And I've got four different algorithms they're all uh, Caesar ciphers, as you can actually see. They're just shifted. But there are four different ones. I want to encrypt hello round house, and I've done it in color for the different letters. And I'm going to use different encryption algorithms depending on where in that sequence the actual letter occurs. So we've got four possible ways of encrypting the letters above the bar there, four different encryption algorithms. I want to encrypt hello round house, which I've got so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, going across the top. So I encrypt the first, the fifth, the ninth, the thirteenth letter going across. Those labeled one, I use the first row, which is the red row here. So let's just see. The first character, I'm going to encrypt an H. I encrypt an H using the first row. That's a D. A D appears here. I want to encrypt E for hello. Here's E. It's in the second position, in the, so I use the second row, that's a W. I want to encrypt an L. The third row gives a Z, there's the Z. I want to encrypt another L. The fourth row gives a Y, there's a Y. I now need to go back to the beginning. I want to encrypt an O. It's numbered one, it's encrypted as a K. Okay, and look what happens. Actually, I'm encrypting the same letter twice here, and I get different results, which is not surprising. There are different encryption algorithms used to do that. The effect of doing this sort of thing is to get rid of a lot of the information which enables 
a simple substitution cipher, to be cracked so easily. Well, it doesn't quite work. You just need a bigger message, essentially, to crack it. What do you do? Well, if we work, we, we saw on the previous slide that there were characteristic frequencies of English text. If you could restrict yourself to the first, the ones labeled one here, either first, fifth, ninth, thirteenth, ones labeled, labeled red there, if you restrict yourself to those and you have enough text, you'd be able to do pretty much the same sort of frequency analysis. That holds also for the characters at 2, 6, 10, 14, similarly for 3, 7, add 4, add 4, and things like that. I don't like to do maths in public, right? <laughs> okay, so it doesn't quite work. But the idea of changing the cipher and using different ciphers for different, as you get progressively go along your character stream, is a good one. Let's see what we can do about it. And how about changing the cipher after every character? Let's look at rotors. A rotor, it was an idea by Scabius, uh, who was behind Enigma, but also some other people, three people in the United States. It's an electromechanical device for implementing a simple substitution. So we have three rotors here. These are Enigma rotors, in fact, of one form or another. You can actually see they can rotate. There are different forms of contacts here. Essentially, the schematic here, the yellow on, the on your left, shows that each of the contacts on the right is mapped to some contacts on the left, and everything maps to something on one side, everything on one side maps to something on the other side, and here you can see the two forms of contacts here. You can see the flat contacts just here, and the rather pronged-like contacts on the other side. These implement a simple substitution. Simple substitution means if an electric circuit is made involving, for example, A and Y here, is that right? No, sorry. <laughs> B and Y, that's the substitution it's actually making. Okay. The inner wheel, this is called Ringstellungen, or ring pairs, I suppose, ring positions. You might have seen, let's have a quick look at the other thing. You'll notice that there's the contacts internally and this numbers on the outside. Sometimes they're letters, sometimes they're numbers. But those aren't fixed. You can actually change the relative positions of those. It's like having a tire with the alphabet on, or numbers in this case. Okay, so you can view the alphabet ring, or the number ring in the previous one, as a tire, which could be rotated around the internal wiring. Remember, the internal wiring is just mapping. There's a series of wires from one side to the other, 26 wires doing that. The position, the relative position you actually hold those at is part of your secret key, and you need to keep it to yourself and your friends. Okay. Now, there's a spring clip on each rotor because they have to be set. You put it around, and then you clip, and that fixes that position. Once they're fixed, they go into the Enigma or other rotor cipher, and then you can use them. Okay. We'll come back to this later. You put them together. Here's a picture of an Enigma machine on the left. Um, on the right here, you see the internals of one of these things where we have three rotors in a row here. The contacts of one, I've got from this uh, contacts here, I draw a rotor map to contacts here. The contacts here touch on the second rotor, map over to contacts over here, and on the third rotor here. Every different position, relative positioning of the rotors defines a different substitution algorithm. And that's why Enigma and other rotor ciphers are so good. Okay. There's another one. You can actually see the prongs on one side. of the This is three rotors stuck on a stack. Okay. And incidentally, uh, there's a museum. I'd refer you to this uh, web address. There's lots and lots, about 280 photographs of Enigma. So if Enigma is your thing and other rotor ciphers, that's the place to go. It's part of Enigma, which is a plug board, and this has some interesting properties, okay? It's very similar. You see telephonists in the past do this and this and connect things. This is what the plug board does. It simply takes in a letter from one side, or two pairs of letters, and swaps them. So as letters go in, they come out the other side, exchanged. Some, nothing happens. They just come out as themselves. There's a limited number of these. In the original Enigma, there were six possible pairs which you could swap over, went up to 10 later in the war. And also just to point out that if you apply one of these mappings uh, once and then you apply it again, 
the effect is essentially nothing happens. It's its own inverse, if you like. It undoes itself. In other words, if you swap A and B, and then you swap B and A, don't be surprised if you get back to where you started. That's essentially what it's saying here. And there's a picture of the plug board. You can see it's not actually very pretty, uh, but you can see the telephony uh, analogy. And that's it. So let's see this enigma in action. This is a three rotor enigma. There were others, there were four rotors, and also seven rotors, and I think 11 rotors at some time. But essentially, this, this was the standard one, certainly in the early parts of the war anyway. The plug board switches pairs of characters, as you've just seen. And it does them in pairs, and that has consequences. Suppose I press down on my typewriter key, you're gonna see this fairly shortly, in fact, O, it goes through the plug board and gets bunged in, to use a technical term, of this set of rotors here. It's gone through the contacts there. Now each rotor has got wires inside. Whatever that contact is wired to on the left-hand side of the right-hand rotor, it goes through, it makes contact with the second rotor, it gets transferred via some internal wiring of the second rotor, it then goes through, and also goes through the third rotor, and then it hits something called a reflector which essentially just maps pairs of contacts to each other. And so it comes back. It comes through the plug board, and T lights up. That's all well and good. As a consequence of this, no character is ever mapped to itself. If you're encrypting A, you never get A. If you encrypt B, you never get B. Does that matter? They didn't think so. Does it matter? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> As a rule, you shouldn't give a cryptanalyst the slightest sniff of information. That's another technical term. Right? <laughs> Character pairs are each other's encipherment. In other words, if O is enciphered as T, then had I pressed T here, O would have lit up. So if O is enciphered as T, then T is enciphered as O. Does it matter? Yes. Did they realize how it mattered? No. So we've gone through it once, and that's what happened. Now we rotate the rotor R. It sort of turns round by 1 26th of a rotation. It returns round by one letter, if you like. They revolve in, I suppose, odometer is probably uh, the word for it, but you know, you know how your myelometer on your car goes round and you get very excited when it goes 100,000 or whatever. It's doing that sort of thing. The tenths are going not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, click, right? That's roughly speaking what happens here. Uh, there is a little bit of bizarreness as to the exact points it actually chooses to exchange, to, to go round, but that's what's happening. So we rotate it by one position because we've actually entered a character. We press O again. It goes through the plug board. It's got to the same position from the, from the right, but now the wiring is different because that rotor has rotated by once. So it actually follows a different path. Through and it follows it back, and it comes out as W. The same character, O has been encrypted twice, but it's been now encrypted as two different letters. And we can keep on, click, 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 click. And we can keep on rotating the ciphers, it'll go like the myelometer on your car, and every possible point is a different algorithm. So you have 26 times 26 times 26, which is something like 17,256 or something like that. It's 17,000 something. <laughs> different algorithms there. Provided you and I have set the machines up in the same way, in an identical fashion, we can exchange secret messages with each other. Uh, and that's a big proviso there, right? Okay. Each machine is ready to do an encryption or a decryption. We basically need to agree on the following. Which rotors have you used? I said there was only three rotors there. Actually, there's a choice. You can pick them off a shelf and put them in. You have to agree on those ring positions, the relative positioning of the outer wheel and the inner core wiring. You have to agree on which plugs you're choosing to put in, which pairs are going to be exchanged in the plug board. And finally, you need to agree some starting position for the actual rotors, where they are in their rotation, if you like. Uh, if not, you will be able to communicate in secret, 
but you won't be able to understand each other, and that's, that's generally considered a disadvantage. Here's a uh, position. These actually have three of those. Can I just actually say? So three of these, the ones in blue, are agreed in advance and recorded on a bit of paper. The ones in red we have to do on the spot. So here we have them. You can actually see uh, Valzen and Lager. Three, the top row there. 31 is the date. That's the datum. 314 says pick rota three out of the bucket, put it in. Pick rota one out of the bucket, put it next. Pick rota four out of the bucket and put it next. There's typically five, seven, or whatever rotas to choose from. The Ringstellungen are the uh, positions of the relative wiring and the alphabet wheels. The uh, Steckverbindungen the, are the plug board connections, essentially. And there are 10 of those here. So this is, comes from later on in the war. You don't need to know about the Ken grouping. That basically just tells people whether the message is intended for them. But these were distributed in advance on paper, and people would set their machine up using these. But it doesn't solve that problem about where do we start for each message. How do you agree a message key? Well, we do the following. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to demonstrate part of it to you. We van. All right. Wine. You've had some. OK, right? Uh, I think that's all you're getting, but you've had some, right? <laughs> van, V-I-N. We actually set, having done all that previously, we set the rotors up to look V-I-N when we actually see the top. That defines where they are in their rotating cycle. I've decided for this message, we're going to communicate RCM. And that is going to be the key, we, the setting we use to actually set up to communicate the message which we really want. Unfortunately, I have Trevor there. Sorry, I'll, I'll refer to this. Long, it's a long sentence. That's a clause. Unfortunately, we have Trevor here. We have me here. I want to communicate RCM so we can set this up for a message communication, but there's all you in the room. I'm afraid that's unfortunate from the point of view of cryptographic security. I'd like to communicate this to Trevor so we can actually communicate, but everyone else is around. But Trevor has an Enigma machine. I have an Enigma machine. Can we use the Enigma machine to convey RCM in secret? So what we do is this is going to be the settings we're going to use for our message, and we're going to use the Enigma machine to actually do the encryption of that and pass it in encryption. I'm going to actually transmit RCM, RCM. I'll explain why that is in a minute. I put it through Enigma. It comes out as DWL. F, X, J. I then shout, van, V, I, N, D, W, L, L, F, X, J. Trevor sets that to V, I, N, which is the initial position for Enigma, and now bungs through the encrypted ciphertext, D, W, L, F, X, J, and recovers RCM, RCM. Trevor now knows RCM. I don't know RCM because I sent it. You're none the wiser. The only thing which is passed across is in encrypted text, from which we're actually going to use RCM as the starting positions for our messages for that particular message. The reason you send it twice, and this was an operating procedure, was that if there was anything lost in transmission or a mistake, it would become apparent. So you get RCM, GCM, or something. You've got a mistake. It, you should receive identical triplets. Let's look at an Enigma in action. I shall just minimize that. This is Enigma, nice bit of software. Let's set this up to, actually, shall we look inside? I always want to look inside stuff. This is dangerous. So this is a wonderful bit of software, incidentally. It's on the web. You can see Enigma there. B is a, a reflection rotor. You've got three rotors there. They're set up to AAA. In practice, you choose some different thing, which we're going to do very shortly. So let me just close this. Uh, I think it's that one we'll do. And here's two other things I could have chosen, but they're in one, two, three. OK. So what it, ooh, it clicks, yes. Let's set the initial rotor positions up to D. Oh, no, it wasn't D, was it? It was Van, wasn't it? And I shall simulate. I should have done this the other way around. <laughs> I'll set them up to there. Oops. 
my sympathies are with the operators, actually, who actually survived it. OK. I shout, VIN. We have our Enigma machines. I want, now you're going to have to pay attention here, right? Let's do it. R. D. OK. C. W. So DW. M. L. Let's leave it, let's cut while we're ahead. DWM. I shout across, VIN. Trevor sets it up to VIN. DW, what was it? DWL. M. OK, right, let's try D. R. C. And what was the other one? L. L, where's L? M. And take it from me if we'd actually done a, uh, uh, so two again. F, X, J, F, X. This should be M. Right. Okay, so you get the idea. We can actually communicate. No one else has seen RCM, RCM, because we pass it an encryption link. Okay. So let's bring the slide back up again. And VIT is exactly where they've moved on to. What we do now is we now set our things to RCM. And if I want to, I'm assuming we're actually trying to break the naval enigma cipher. So this is, uh, I have no idea what the German equivalent of shiver me timbers is. <laughs> Perhaps some of you do. But, you know, I set them, but we both set them up to RCM, and I encrypt shiver me timbers. And you can actually do it. Incidentally, and I can show you on the same settings, it comes out as that. I can now pass that across to Trevor, who bungs it in in the same way, types at the other side, and will recover Shiver Me Timbers, which is the message I wanted to communicate, uh, arguably the most important message of the night. So, what's actually going on here? How many possibilities are there for Enigma configurations? Well, there are quite a few. Let's have a look. With six plugs, uh, there's, that's the number of different ways you can actually plug stuff. The ring shell alone, there are 26 times 26 at least, more in some things, so that's 676. The rotors, now this is the internal wiring. How many different wirings are there for the three rotors? Well, there's 26 times 25, times 24, times 23, times 22. That's 26 factorial. Cube that. Technically speaking, that's a lot. <laughs> We could have actually put the session key up. That's where exactly that was the VIN or the RCM is actually for the actual message in 26 times 26 times 26 different ways. It's 70,576. I got it wrong. The reflector, that's the number of ways you can wire that up. That's the total number possible. Sound impo sounds imposing, doesn't it? Sounds difficulty. I'd like to place this in historical context for those people who fret in current day circumstances. That's the UK national debt. <laughs> Trivial, I'm sorry, <laughs> by comparison. It really helps, actually, if you can get hold of some Enigma machines to actually reduce parts of this, this the amount of combinations you need to consider. And you can. And it, we came by them by a variety of ways. Indeed, we were actually particularly indebted to a number of Polish mathematicians who helped us in that, I should point out. But practically speaking, we worked out what the wiring was. We got a lot of help from three Polish mathematicians, in Rajewski in particular, but there were quite a number, and we got a great deal of help from them. We reduced the number of possibilities. Well, repeating the guide setting, for example, RCM, RCM, in order that we could actually have this initial setting uh, set up between us, uh, allows mistakes in transmission or even just in typing, which, of course, you know, I couldn't remember what I'd actually said, uh, to be detected. But it also allows a way into the cipher. If you monitored enough messages, you did actually about one in eight, uh, you get, uh, eventually get some which actually have letters repeated. So for example, if the thing I shouted was K-I-E, and the thing I also sent was S-P-E-S-N-T, oh, sorry, this is the encryption of K-I-E here, S and S, S and S here are the encryption of something. It's a common letter, and it's the same letter. We might not know what it is, but it's the same letter. Ditto on the other one, VB, LTS, as my, the thing we shout at each other, but VBY, QGY, something has been encrypted twice. It's the third letter in that triplet, which was RCM when I did it. 
but that, that letter is encrypted the same way twice. You get these about one in eight, and it actually allows you to make reason about the, what the keys are. That the system could produce such encrypted uh, keys ruled out many combinations. Some keys can produce the sort of repeated letters in those positions, some can't. Now the bomb, which was a bit of electromechanical wizardry, uh, developed at uh, Bletchley Park, following on from some work in Poland during the 1930s, incidentally, and the Poles actually had good reason to want to break uh, German crypto systems at that time, and they were marvelous in doing it, I should point out. The bomb is a special piece of electromechanical equipment. Uh, parts of it weighed almost a ton. It's about six foot tall, eight foot wide, two foot, oh, it's, it was a big piece of kit, okay. <laughs> but by and large, it checks that some things are possible and some things aren't with particular keys or combinations for configurations. It all went wrong in 1940 when that little insight, the fact that things were repeating, those triples were being repeated, uh, was stopped. So the way we actually communicate VIN to each other, or RCM to each other, is we just do it once. That has consequences. You can't use that method of repeated letters appearing in the encrypt double encryptions. Does that solve the problem? Well, actually, no. There were more problems ahead. Now, this gets quite interesting. <laughs> this is called the use of cribs, or, to give a subtitle, dear sir, my politeness will get me into trouble, uh, because one of the things that the German military were actually very hot on was they were very polite to each other in communications. They always addressed each other with their title, for example. Uh, I'm always very surprised when somebody comes up to me and addresses me as Professor X. I don't, never quite know what to do. It always seems a bit embarrassing. But it does actually happen occasionally. We just don't do this in the UK, and certainly not in the modern UK. But if you're in the military, you probably do. And certainly if you're in the military in the 1940s, you certainly did. Okay. Inspiration needed. Well, here's a little bit of inspiration. Let's look at Attack at Dawn and assume that this is the ciphertext which actually comes out of Enigma. So Attack at Dawn and WSN, PNL, KLSTCS. Well, and so those are the steps. Step one, step two, step three. We Remember that encryptions work in purse. That's important. So if A encrypts as W in the first round, W encrypts as A, had we chosen to do that encryption. What we see here is a summary of what's going on, some facts going on over there. So if we look at A and uh, K, we look at column seven there, A and K are the mutual encryptions of each other at uh, seven, at round seven. A and T, if you look at column 10 here, says in round 10, A and T are the encryptions of each other. What we've seen is that attack at dawn is encrypted as T, therefore we know that T would have been encrypted as A had we done that because they encrypt they're in reversible pairs. We can build up these graphs here, and these actually allow us to make some deductions about what's possible with respect to the keys and what's not. And in particular, this triangle here is going to be important for us, the one with K, L, T, A, K. I'm going to show you what we can do about that and how we can actually exploit some of the features of the algorithm. I'm going to let S1 means this is what the, the, the bulk of the scrambling unit does uh, in the first round. This is without the plug board, okay? I'm going to let S2 say what it does at the second step without thinking of the plug board, just the operation of the rotors. Now, this is a little bit technical, so hold on. What we're going to do is we're going to guess a key setting, a configuration for Enigma, and we're going to run it. We're going to bung data in and get data out and then ask, is that what we expected or is the, what does this tell us? Well, forget about the plug settings. Now, technically speaking, they add hugely to the number of possible combinations. But there's a way around it, and this was actually discovered. Okay. Let's assume, okay, A encrypts as T. We had one of those, yeah, A and T, certainly at round 10. That's what that arc is telling you. That was probably the attack at, uh, or no, it's, it's, yeah, at round 10. That, what that tells us, A goes into the plugger, the, the stecker, the, so, yeah, the, the plug board, sorry, I'm mixing languages here, and something comes out the end, it goes into the rotors, 
something comes out of the rotors, and when it gets, comes through the plug board again, it comes out as a T, because A was encrypted as T. We don't know what that internal, we know that, provided our guess is correct with attack at dawn really was the message actually encrypted. We can come back to that later. We don't know what that intermediate value is. Well, let's take a guess. Why not guessing? It, it pays to be lucky, right? And if you can't be lucky, try everything, right? <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> Our first try is going to be that when you bung A through the plug board, let's suppose it's Y. What happens now? Well, we've set our system up with a particular set of keys, and we want to ask, is that assumption there, that this intermediate value is a Y, consistent with that key choice? Well, so what, what do we do? We bug it into our, our simulation of the scrambling system, and we get something out. Let's call it Q. Now, remember how the plug board works. It, pl it plugs things in pairs. We know the thing that came out here was a T. We don't know what that is, but we've just actually calculated if that was correct, that the plug, when you bung A through the plug, was a Y, you would get Q out if that were the key, and we know we saw T. Therefore, Q, if Q, when you plug it through here, gives a T, T, when you bung it the other way, must give a Q. And I'm going to use that over here. So we've related Q, plug of T, and plug of A. We can now say, OK, let's consider something else. How can we relate T and L? Well, T and L are related, i.e. they're the mutual encryptions of each other, at the eighth step. So if we bung T through here, we get Q equals plug, plug of T. It goes through the rotor. Something else comes out. We note what it is, say G. And we know when it comes here, it ends up being L, because it's the that's how attack at dawn, the encryption worked. But we know that G must be the plug of L, because L is the plug of G. We can repeat this four times. And essentially, what happens is we just traverse those arcs of that graph. We took a guess that plug of A was Y. And you'll notice these two are related, these two are related, these two are related. And we end up calculating that plug of A is equal to N. N is not Y. That's the linguistic uh, analysis for the evening. You've reached a contradiction. What does that tell you? It tells you that assumption there was wrong. Choose another one. And so, and this actually, we're able to do this because of the particular way the plug board works by exchanging pairs. That's a nice bit of inspiration. That's the most difficult part of the evening. Well, for you anyway, right? <laughs> OK. We've turned a feature of the system, the plug board letter placing pairing, into an exploitable weakness. Now, the bomb could explore configurations automatically to determine the configurations were consistent with our guesses or reach contradictions to say it's just not possible. In a sense, uh, the bombs of various sorts, and so they had their origins uh, in Poland, and we souped them up a bit, and then Gordon, by a Turing, Gordon Welchman came along and said, you can make them much, much more efficient, just do something called the diagonal board. Uh, they're essentially what we would describe in modern-day computer parlance as application-specific model checkers, which we discovered in 1993. <laughs> a bit more general form, right? Okay. No self-regard. What does this mean? Well, I, get, I said something to you. I said... Um, I say quite a lot of things to you, but one of the things I did point out, which you may remember, is that no character encrypts as itself. Well, that, if you are going to take a guess as to what text is, is actually helpful. So, for example, you've got here Wetter Vorhersage, which is weather forecast in German. You've got the encrypted text up top. If you assume that Wetter Vorhersage appears somewhere, it can't appear like that, because E is encrypted as E. That's telling you those Vetter Herforsaga does not correspond to that bit of text. If we shifted them along one, there is at very least no contradiction. Might not actually be the, they might not have encrypted that. Uh, the Germans weren't particularly keen on releasing what they'd actually encrypted. It sort of defeated the object of the thing. <laughs> but it allows you to rule out certain choices of which they were. 
again, a feature of the algorithm is turned into an exploitable WAN. Right, some lessons that we learned. People are our greatest asset. What planet am I on? Um, you hear management say this all the time. Human resources departments say it all the time. It is, in fact, true. There is a security analog of this, which is uh, people are our worst nightmare. <laughs> and if there's one message you should go away from with this evening, it is this, because it is both are actually true. But let's see how this manifests itself with Enigma. Long messages were encrypted, split and encrypted with their own keys. So part one, part two, part three. There were operating procedures which says you should limit the number of characters in each particular segment for all manner of reasons. So, for example, this would be the equivalent of VIN. This is the encryption of whatever it is we choose to have as the setup, the RCM in our case, et cetera. One's called the indicator, the other is the encrypted key or the indicator setting. And we had to choose something. I chose RCM, which was going to be the initialization for the actual message transfer. Then analysts noted something. A number of messages turned up with the following sort of characteristics. QAY, this is the keyboard on Enigma. QAY, something which they, they made up, we'll come back to that in a minute, and then they had no control over the NPR, that's what Enigma produces before it gives it to you. The second part was EDC, and the third part was TGB. Now then, let's, and there's nothing wrong with this, because you shout this to the world. That's VIN. That's the bit we actually shout. The question is, what? <laughs> Given that an operator had chosen this particular way of coming up with that initial setting, the VIN equivalent, if you like, what is he or she, uh, actually it's going to be a he uh, in those days, what is he going to choose for the middle thing, which is going to be the actual setting? Well, don't be surprised if WSX, <laughs> RFV, and ZHN were high on the list of things to do. Um, what does this mean? Was this the Enigma operating procedure? Did they specify this sort of behavior? Uh, not by a million miles. This is what operators do in practice. Uh, they're a bit lazy. Well, they're a bit lazy, but also they believe that Enigma was magic. There's a real belief that crypto systems are just so secure, you can do what the hell you like. However, it has to say, so they were also a bit lazy in places. Uh, it has to be saying, what, the Germans? Lazy? Uh, when, you're, when you're a crypto operator and you get up in the morning, I don't think conforming to English stereotypes of Germanic disposition <laughs> is really top of your agenda, okay? Okay. Suppose two single part messages were intercepted and the indicators were QUE, QWE, and QAP. Well, you might conclude that the possible next parts were oh, uh, ASD, which is, of course, let me just have a look at this. Where's it on here? ASD. And OK, OK, so QAP, let's look at it. Uh, OK, why? Well, personally, I think it's quite creative, but <laughs> it's just not cryptographically very strong. Here are some other possibilities. Let's see if you can get them. LON, what's the, that, if that's going to be the equivalent of VIN, that's the first of the triple, what are you going to choose for your message setting? That's the right answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK, right, good. New. Mm. <laughs> Tom, think cowboy. Tom Mix, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I can only assume that this actually happened, incidentally, this was wrought by some of the American cryptonists who were actually helping us. Uh, I can only assume that Tom Mix in certain parts uh, had the equivalent status of a Norman wisdom in Albania. <laughs> <laughs> Why else would this crop up? They had a very particular set of uh, film tastes. Setting up the machine at the beginning of the day, I said, some parts of the, of the key are actually arranged beforehand. But you had to actually fix the internal wiring coordination with the alphabet wheel. What happens there? Well, if you want to have it fixed with an R, you're almost certainly going to finish and click with the clip with the R facing you. That's just how you actually set these things up. What do you do then? You pick it up and you plonk it in the Enigma machine. What else can you do? Okay, and then you close, you do this for all three wheels and you close the lid. This is problematic. When the rotor is put in the machine, it's very likely that the, the Ringstellung, the actual pair rate position, is facing you. And that's the same for all three. 
You then have to choose one of the equivalent of VIN. How, what are you going to do? Now, strictly speaking, when you've done all three, you should be whirring these wheels with a great deal of effort so that you have a random setting. But in practice, you might just go, ch -ch 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 -ch, not fiddle with them very much at all. And if you're only fiddling within that sort of angle, you vastly reduce the number of combinations which you need to consider. It's even possible that if you set them, you know, ring setting, ring setting, ring setting, so that they're in a row, if you're really lazy, you'll use that as the equivalent of VIN, and you'll just shout it to, across the, 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 the net, or what, sorry, not the net's quite the crowd, across the airwaves. You can tell what generation I'm from. Across the airwaves, you can just shout it. And essentially, you are screaming the key. Uh, okay, which is what the blue is actually saying. Some things, somebody noticed this, and although we tend to think of cryptography as extraordinary mathematical achievement and breaking the equivalence enough mathematical achievement, it was in strong part. But it's also these little insights which help greatly. It's essentially user profiling. This is what the CIA and the police actually do. They'll try to get inside the mind of particular individuals, and in this case, the operators. So these sorts of insights as to the shortcuts that operators would take, who was killing known as the hair evil tip, John Harivel actually died in, I think, November last year. It's, it's about November last year. Very important, really helpful. There were many different skills on display at Bletchley. Great mathematicians. Turing was very, very good and adored by quite a number of people there. There were great engineers. Tommy Flowers, he's the man who, built, who, was, who conceived Colossus. Slightly eccentric. He was the only person who thought Colossus would work with 1,500 valves. It did and helped crack uh, Lorentz. There was insight into human behavior from quite a few, her evil. We have this problem today. There's a paper called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. We can do encryption, technically speaking. Cryptographers have been working on this for some time. We know how to do it. Unfortunately, we can't get other people to do it. That's the problem because the interfaces we actually provide are too difficult. I do like to think of Bletchley Park as operating as perhaps one of the first interdisciplinary research centers. They had linguists there for sure. They had, the thing which probably uh, united most of them was an ability and a desire to solve crosswords. Uh, and it's interesting to just put yourself in the position of those people who were actually at Bletchley Park, the frustration you would have felt from time to time, and often they went 10 months or 11 months without actually being able to solve something when there was a change in operating practices or somebody added a rotor or was a good idea, not very popular with people at Bletchley. Uh, you can imagine the strain they would have been under. And essentially, I was thinking about this earlier today, and I came to the conclusion that when you're, you know, you're bashing your head against a brick wall, it's a bit like the frustration you would feel uh, when you can't solve one of the Sunday uh, broadsheets, if there are those things anymore, Sunday broadsheets, cryptic crosswords, but with the added free song that people's lives are at stake. And there is a case I've seen an interview with Roy Jenkins where he said, sometimes my brain just fried, and he had a very substantial brain. <laughs> The truth will out. Some lessons don't rely on the secrecy of design. We know this from, this is a traditional cryptographic principle from uh, Kerkhoff's principles from the 19th century. Security should rest on the choice of the key alone. Don't rely on your internal wirings remaining secret. If you've got several thousand Enigma machines out there, someone's going to find one sometime. Someone isn't going to be able to blow it up in time before it gets captured. And in fact, those sort of things happened. It helps enormously to have the wiring diagrams for the rotors. A lot. These were compromised in a variety of ways. Rajewski managed to reverse engineer the wiring using some mathematics of permutations. It was fantastic stuff. Uh, also, Enigma machines were actually captured on their delivery via a special postal network. Now, that wouldn't happen, would it? <laughs> or could it? Well, it nearly happened with the misplacement or unaccounted whereabouts, is probably where I put it, of 25 million signatures for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs not so long ago. And actually, government almost closed down when that happened. Uh, it, it was seen to be a priority to sort that out. Lessons learned. Fast forward to 1976 and the emergence of the data encryption standard. They made the design public. Now, you don't need to understand the details of this. That's 16 substitutions in a row, little substitution ciphers. It came out in 1976. It was meant to encrypt not particularly sensitive data. This is part of the internals, and the only thing you need to know is those boxes there are called substitution boxes. They take six bits of information in and spit out four in a way defined by this table. The actual nature of these substitutions is crucial to the security of the standard. So the details don't matter. 
what you need to understand and appreciate is that the design was public. Have we learned our lesson? No, because we didn't say what the, design, the rationale was. We just said, here's the design. Someone said, but why is it that way? I said, don't ask. <laughs> Trust us, it's good. It was, <laughs> the key length was controversial. The NSA certainly interfered, that's the National Security Agency, interfered to actually have the key length reduced from 128 bits to 64 bits, or 56 bits, working bits, in fact. The NSA did tinker with the S-boxes before it went out as a standard. There was suspicion over the NSA's motives, and conspiracy theory abounds. This may be justified, but in some ways it may not. Let me explain why. Theoretically promising methods, in particular something called differential cryptanalysis, was discovered in the late 80s, 88, 89, um, DES was surprising, that's the data encryption center, was surprisingly resilient to this form of attack. Why? Because it had been designed to be resilient to that sort of attack. This was designed in 1976. The NSA knew about differential cryptanalysis in the early 70s at least, and they'd altered the S-boxes so that the algorithm itself, the data encryption center, was resilient to this attack. The reason they didn't want to say what they'd done and why is because they would have had to have revealed what the attack was. And by implication, they were merrily using it on a whole host of other ciphers uh, across the world. So, anyway. so academics discovered this attack at least 16 years after it was certainly known within government. So that's what you get if you don't release the rationale. We've learned the lesson here. The advanced encryption standard, which was launched around 1999, 2000, there was a public competition. You had to make clear the rationale, and everybody and his dog was invited to attack the candidates. Don't underestimate future compute power. I think people did enormously. If people had realized just to what extent the bombs could rattle into, into shape and actually compromise security, they would have done something about the cipher. I'll probably skip across some of these bits here. Let's just look at the projecting. Uh, this is supercomputing. You can see which direction it's going. It's loosely speaking 45 degrees. <laughs> so this is the sum. It actually gives the best so far as the middle one. The sum total of supercomputing power is the green there. You can actually just see the rate of progress we've got. 1993, 100 gigaflops. We've got goes up to teraflops and petaflops. This is a thousandfold increase each time. Compute power is getting enormous, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's not to mention what happens when we have quantum computing, which brings a lot of other things along. There were further pieces of computational equipment built. Here are some of the early computers. This is here, Keith Robinson was one. This is Colossus. Colossus was colossal, as you can see. It's a remarkable engineering feat, 1,500 valves. It's probably approximately 10 times bigger than anything else which had been built at the time. Uh, Tommy Flowers had confidence that this would work. It did. I'm not sure other people around had that confidence. But as he said in an interview, I had the power to just go and ask for stuff, and people gave it to me. I didn't have to give reasons. <laughs> Which is interesting, so not having to give rationale clearly has its benefits. Right. Beyond belief, beyond belief. Our systems are unbreakable. We hear this all the time. Unwavering belief in the security of technology is invariably fatal. If there's evidence to suggest that your system has been compromised, you need to act on it. There was huge belief in the security of Enigma. Okay? But we've been here before. Let's fast backwards, if that's the phrase, to 1914, August. The Magdeburg, which was a German cruiser, ran aground in the Baltic just off Odensholm, which was actually Russian territory. Chaos ensues. You can imagine they've got code books on board. They've got crypto on board. They need to divest themselves of this. They can't get off the sandbanks or whatever they were running the ground on. They attempted to refloat it. It didn't work. They eventually tried to get rid of the crypto things. They burnt some of the books, and they threw some over, over, overboard which sank to a depth of about 20 feet. The ship was scuttled, it was blown up. The Russians managed to get them back. They also missed one which was locked in someone's cabinet. The sort of thing you'd miss if you're actually trying to scuttle a ship, and you know, people were killed here as well. The Russians managed to get them back, including material ditched overboard by diving, and compromising the entire Navy's uh, cryptographic security. They passed the information to the prime premier naval power of the time, which was Britain. Not sure whether how relations went on from that point in time. It was clearly, clearly, clearly at, a, at a, a good point. The German Navy concluded eventually that their systems had been compromised, but they had the wrong explanation. They thought it would happen some other way. The response was somewhat tokenistic. They changed part of the keying structure called the super encipherment key, but the code books which had actually been compromised 
We just carried on using them for some considerable period of time. There was quite a lot of evidence to suggest that the British seemed to be remarkably good from that point onwards at predicting where German naval operations were taking place. The Germans actually suspected betrayal. Again, it's this confidence in the belief in your crypto system. And this is Kahn, who's probably the best known historian of cryptography around, in fact he is. One probable reason was that very few beliefs are held as widely as the belief in the unbreakability of one's codes. If anybody mentions to you notions such as absolute security, unbreakable, they are clearly mad. And you've heard it in public, an independent academic has confirmed this, right? Let's actually have a look at some of the where do ideas come from. Let's go to 1997. You might be a bit surprised, but actually, crypto systems consume power. I'm looking for my wallet, not because I think you've stolen it, but because I actually need something in it, which is a smart card. <laughs> right. Okay, I have my smart card here, which I'll pick out. Actually, it's, it's, oh, this is better. This is my business card, so you don't know which bank I actually bank with. <laughs> right. <laughs> Your smart card consumes power. By monitoring the power on here, you can actually work out what's going on inside. What's going on inside may depend on the crypto key. So by monitoring the power, you may be able to work out what your secret crypto key, which controls the encryption on this paper card. <laughs> right, okay. This is one where this is called differential power analysis and or simple power analysis. There's a more sophisticated version called differential power analysis. But essentially, you're using the power to actually consume, to actually convey information. And this is a power trace on the data encryption standard. You'll notice there are 16 repeating bulges there. There are 16 rounds in the encryption in data encryption standard. It gets more complex, you can try and hide it, but you can only hide it so much. What's five times five? This is what you come to university for, right? 25. What's 25 times 25? What's 625 times 625? A lot, to use the technical term I used earlier, that's absolutely right. It's that. The time taken to do different calculations depends on what calculations you're doing. We know that. You know that from your own personal experience. RSA is a widely used crypto algorithm. It has a very simple method of doing encryption. It takes your plain text message, which is represented as a number, raises it to a power, loosely speaking, about this long, and takes the modulus mod n, where n is a very big number. It's raising something there to a power d, which is a big secret. Different messages you encrypt to that power, like uh, p to the 15, it's actually, it's not, it's several hundred digits long, okay? Different plain texts give rise to different timings. The sum of those timings is information. You can actually use the, those, yeah, not the sum, you can use that set of timings to actually work out what the key, unless you take action against. This came as a bit of a shock. Okay. DNA computing, or slop top computing as I like to think of it. You can actually compute with DNA. As you're probably aware, most computing is done with binary, zeros and ones. But essentially, it's all about taking one string of noughts and ones and turning it into another string of noughts and ones that someone else is happy with. By and large, you can do this with uh, DNA strands. You can actually compute with the adenine, cymine, guanine, and thiamine here. You can rip DNA strands apart, the helical strands apart. You can actually get new ones. You can breed them. You can chop. You can merge. You can make changes, etc. You can do general computing. It's been estimated. It was, this was work done back in the 1990s. You can use DNA in a beaker in about six months to break the data encryption standard. Heading towards the end, okay, let's skip back 15 or 16th century manuscript. This is the Voynich manuscript. Uh, it's written, it's got lots of flowery details and herb, pictures of herbs and things like this, and it has what appears to be gobbledygook in it all over the place. Um, it's in some American university, is it Harvard? Yale. Yale, thank you. That's, this is my wife right here, <laughs> whom, whom I will get to give my, the rest of my lecture. Right? <laughs> uh, some believe it's a hoax. We don't actually know what language it's in. It could be a hoax. It's probably not. There's been some work done recently, whatever. There's a lot of it. It looks like pseudo-random gibberish. Well, that's what most cryptography stuff does. We ought to be able to data mine this and get some insight into the problem. There are other 
classical ciphers which remain unsolved, some from the reign of Philip II. I'd like to give this a go. This has remained un, unattacked. I said, well, not unattacked. It's remained unsolved for 600 years. I'm determined to give it a go, and I think that's what I'll be doing fairly shortly. So if you don't hear from me in the next 10 years, you know what I've done. <laughs> and in particular, you know what I haven't done. <laughs> OK. And finally, I'll bring this to an end. We've seen how a very considerable array of multidisciplinary talent was brought to bear on Enigma and other ciphers. Bletchley was, as far as I can see, the first interdisciplinary research center. We're learning the same lessons over and over again with respect to users. We're heading for days of extraordinary compute power, the implications of which I don't think we fully understand quite yet. We've seen how a subject which has mathematics at its heart has seen shocks from other parts, in particular from physics and engineering and biology, DNA computing. Nobody expected people to, comp to break the data encryption standard with DNA. Nobody really expected to break uh, smart card security with timing analysis. And nobody, well, when I say nobody, I need to be a bit careful. The, the principle was known, but the ease with which it was done came as a real shock. Okay. And still, we still can't break ciphers from centuries ago. And at that, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it.